Thank you for coming to the Head and Neck Cancer Survivorship Symposium. This is a special uh, program that is a little different for those who've come to some of our uh, Eye and Ear Foundation uh, Sight and Sound Bite Symposiums. You've been invited to this, um, which is really a four-part program on survivorship, a concentrated effort through the month of August that's being put on by our Department of Otolaryngology here at the University of Pittsburgh. But the full series you will hear from um, not just the University of Pittsburgh, but uh, other institutions from around the country, as well as in Canada, that are doing programs similar to this in head and neck cancer survivorship. Today's program, um, August 4th, Clinical Science Advances in Survivorship Care uh, by Dr. Jonas Johnson and his team. Dr. Johnson is our uh, distinguished um, uh, professor of otolaryngology at the University of Pittsburgh and chairman of the Department of Otolaryngology and the Eugene N. Myers Chair um, at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. Dr. Johnson, if you would begin our program, uh, first of four part series uh, in survivorship. Uh, thank you, Lonnie, uh, and thank you to the Ioneer Foundation of Pittsburgh. Uh, and welcome to all of those uh, of you who've joined us online for this uh, special program. Uh, I will say parenthetically that we're optimistic that next year's program will be shoulder to shoulder uh, live uh, in uh, a place close to you. Um, today's uh, program consists of three speakers. So I'll introduce them all to you first. Uh, Dr. Marcy Nielsen is a clinical scientist whose uh, primary appointment is in acute and tertiary care nursing at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. She has a secondary appointment in otolaryngology. Uh, Marcy will review a recent science uh, on late and long-term effects of treatment after head and neck cancer. Subsequently, uh, Dr. Or, uh, subsequently, Jamira Morris will uh, take the podium. Jamira is currently a senior in medical school here at the University of Pittsburgh. Jamira took uh, a Dean's Research Fellowship year, which she just com completed. And during that time, she's been deeply involved in a number of clinical projects and she'll share uh, one with you. And then our last speaker this morning is gonna be Dr. Uh, Alexandra uh, Harris. Uh, Dr. Harris uh, is currently doing a research year with us in survivorship. And she is going to address uh, the issue of neck disability after uh, head and neck irradiation. So uh, with that, uh, Marcy, go ahead and uh, take the podium. Hi, everyone. It's nice to have you here. I'm just going to talk to you about the recent science on late and long-term effects of head and neck cancer. And so this year has been, um, I have nothing to disclose, but this year has been um, fabulous in that we are just coming off the AHNS International Meeting which overarching theme was quality of life and survivorship and really encouraging the field to kind of move in this direction and to think innovatively about how we deal with our patients' kind of needs and symptoms during treatment, but in the long term. And so my, and another benefit to the HNS meeting is that they did have post conferences, where one long post conference or day, half day post conference was focused for APPs who are involved in head and neck cancer survivorship and also a symposium on current concepts of speech and swallowing management. So it was really just a great presentation to see ever, all the work that everyone's been doing. So I was curious um, in what literature has really come out in the last, I'll say six months. So when I looked at the literature for head and neck cancer, you can see how it's really expand exponentially over the years, especially within the last 10 to 15 years. But when you look at sort of trying to get an idea about how much literature really focuses on survivorship, it's a little bit difficult because we all use different keywords. If you combine head and neck with survivorship, there's been about 50 articles since 2021 out of the 8,400 that have been um, targeted head and neck. But then if you look at other late long-term effects or symptoms like dysphagia, you'll find different amounts. So this is not a scientific approach to looking at literature. Um, I really ended up picking articles that I found were interesting, but hopefully you'll enjoy um, what I present. So what I saw in the literature was that this, this theme that 
just continues is that there are complexity um, within the head and neck cancer survivorship care. So their needs are complex. Um, they present with multiple treatment modalities and even changing treatment modalities. And so what do we see? Well, we see that these concerns do impact um, quality of life. So when you look, this is an article that came from Nice, France, and their goal was to look at survivors' needs and concerns. And so they took patients who were about 72 disease-free head and neck cancer patients who were at least one year after treatment. They enrolled in the study, completing the ER, ERTC quality of life and um, a patient concerns inventory, in, in addition to the HADS, which is the hospital anxiety and depression scale. And so the most common needs that you see here may not be surprising. So fear of um, recurrence, dental health, dry mouth, fatigue, speech, voice, eating, and um, chewing and eating were the most commonly reported. And most patients reported on average about four concerns. So again, this gets to the complexity that these, these concerns don't happen in isolation, but do happen kind of together in clusters. And so most of these concerns expand or, or go beyond one discipline. And in this study, uh, most patients did see more than two providers. They saw a head and neck surgeon, a swallowing therapist, and some dental health rehabilitation. Now, when they looked at concerns with quality of life, the most um, predicting variable of long-term quality of life is actually physical or psychological distress, which you don't really see captured in these most common concerns. So it may not be something that patients actually raise, but when you look at their reports on these measures, it does impact quality of life. So what did they see in terms of concerns? Women tended to report more concerns than men. And when there was a trend, when patients started to report more concerns, that their functional quality of life went down. And as you would expect, the symptom prevalence went up. So what does this mean? I think this is just another study highlighting what we know, that patients' concerns are complex and that they can impact outcomes, but maybe we still don't capture the really psychological distress that patients experience in these kind of symptom or needs-based measures like the patient concerns inventory or the University of Washington quality of life. Patients may um, prioritize things, functional over psychological effects. And so since we've started our head and neck cancer clinic, you may have seen these slides if I've presented to you before. Um, and in general, while the number of unique patients we see continues to rise, we've seen over 1,500 um, unique patients since the start of the clinic, these next two numbers don't change much. So 93% of our patients report at least one um, issue that impacts them in the last seven days, and 60% report at least three or more. On mean average, most patients, the mean is, is three. So our patients, again, they're reporting complex needs. And so what are the most common things that they report to us? So swallowing dysfunction, this is in percentiles, so zero to 100%, 50% of patients report swallowing, saliva and pain. And pain, um, chronic pain, which is hard to say because these are all one time, is prevalent and something that we really need to consider. And that is when looking at the literature in the last six months, opioid choice and chronic pain is a recurring theme. So will we continue to see advances in this area and how to mitigate these? Yes, I do believe we will. Um, we are working on a study here in R01 looking at oral pain. But if you can look back at those slides, if you take one sec and just look at the end, again, anxiety and mood kind of fall at the end but we know that anxiety and mood from the previous study really impact quality of life. And so what have we seen in our patients? About 20% of our patients report symptoms of depression that need further evaluation. And in terms of anxiety, this is a little bit less, about 10, 11%. But research has shown, at least in this last year, that psychological distress and at worst, the risk for suicide is higher in head and neck cancer patients. So again, it's something we can need to continue to strive to do a better job of intervening on. And so in the beginning 
of our series in 2018, Dr. Nosazawa Oso Peters presented, and he actually, in his study, saw that head and neck cancer had a four times higher risk than the general public. And he had a follow up paper that came out this year looking at suicide risk and uh, kind of in terms of level, uh, location of residence. And what he saw were that, again, head and neck cancer patients seemed to have higher risk of suicide. And this did um, 405, and this was using the SEER data set. It's a cross-sectional study, and they looked at patients 18 to 74 between 2000 to 2016. So this data would have been pre-COVID. So the residency status um, was determined. And as you can see here, the smallest amount of patients are in rural residency. However, the rural residents have a higher risk of suicide than residents in urban and metropolitan areas. And so many of us are at facilities or at, at, place, at hospital systems where we are in a more urban or metropolitan area, but we do serve these rural individuals. So how can we continue to address the needs, the physical, psychosocial needs of our patients to minimize these risks for long-term quality of life and um, including risk for suicide? So it's difficult and we've and we have done it in way in our fashion, in a multidisciplinary fashion. So in UPMC, we have um, a surgeon, a nurse, physical therapist, dentist, audiology assistant, and dietitian. And up until recently, we did have um, a clinical psychologist in the clinic. And so this was helpful. Patients could meet our individuals, and then we could try to identify services closer to home. The one benefit to COVID, and not that there's many benefits, is that there has been an increase in telemedicine. So a lot of our clinical psychology colleagues are able to deliver interventions, psycho targeting psychosocial needs in a manner that may not have been available to patients before. So it'll be interesting to see how we continue to advance. And so we use a multidisciplinary clinic, um, but there's been new data out from Dr. Barbara Eppersall in Temple, and they have moved towards what they're referring to as a um, quality of life clinic. So their program went from having a half day with a nurse practitioner to having an interdisciplinary clinic with a nurse practitioner, a speech language pathologist, and a physical therapist. And they've had some really good results. Um, and if you are interested, this is a paper in Head and Neck, and the references are at the end, but they were able to see in their first year about 57% of patients and 87% of their patients demonstrated at least one functional impairment. So again, you can see the trend across these studies is that our concerns, um, these patients' concerns are, typically they have more than one concern and it expands across disciplines. So the most common referrals that they had were speech therapy, physical therapy, and audiology. And so, there is really not a gold standard for delivering survivorship care. And your facility really can dictate kind of what program is available to you. But you can see that we have had much success in our multidisciplinary clinic, but there's also other ways not using nine or 10 providers that may be able to just still deliver high quality survivorship care. So are there other ways? Are there other ways for us to really kind of advance what we're doing so you could leverage technology. I already mentioned that um, we've had an increase in telehealth, but um, there's the integration of electronic patient reported outcomes and kind of as standard of care across head and neck oncology. And this was um, at Memorial Sloan Kettering and they were able to kind of identify some obstacles, but in general, they really had good uptake of these patient reported outcomes. So can you standardize this across your, or your head and neck oncology patients so you can really see trends in how patients change no matter what clinic they're in? Um, mobile patient-facing app. So there's a LogPal app, and this would allow patients to report symptoms and track. So when they're not in their clinic, so if you were to have a change in um, their symptom burden, that this would alert some providers. And so could we act um, earlier with symptom changes because we've found them outside of the clinical setting. So if a patient's in between seeing a three-month or a six-month visit, is there something that can trigger 
a referral or a visit using a mobile facing app. And then another very interesting study that is underway. And so if you're interested in the design of the study, it's been published, but the, N, the HN star um, is a tailored evidence-based clinical recommendation um, as using it as a clinical decision support tool. And so can this be used by oncology providers to really recommend standard of care and streamline um, the management of symptoms and other actions, including, including care planning? So these are you know, taking our clinics the next step. And so what more can we do to really provide high quality care? And so what I've hopefully shown you just in this quick 15 minutes is that really head and neck cancer patients continue to experience a multitude of symptoms and treatment related effects that can impact their outcomes. These symptoms and treatment related effects are com they commonly co-occur or they may have appear in symptom clusters and really can we do a better job of understanding what symptoms co-occur? But again, that these treatment really extends beyond one provider. So how can you leverage your multidisciplinary team? And if it's not having the team all together in one place, can you set up a system where you can have referrals, automatic referrals, or referrals to providers that you know can deliver high quality care? And we continue to have obstacles and challenges to providing high quality care, but we may be able to leverage technology to really help us address these issues. And so if you're interested in the slides or interested in the references, I've just presented them here for you. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to um, kind of dig deeper into some of these studies. So next, uh, Jamira Morris is gonna present on health literacy patients, um, caregivers, and really the assessments that can be used to evaluate um, patients' levels of understanding. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Dr. Nelson said, my name is Jamira Morris. I am a fourth year medical student here at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. And um, as Dr. Johnson mentioned, I've just returned from a year of research where I've been very involved in looking at health literacy, um, particularly as it pertains to patients, caregivers, and the different ways that we assess that health literacy. So that's what my talk is on today. Uh, so I have no disclosures, nothing to disclose. So health literacy. <clears throat> health literacy is defined as personal characteristics and social resources that enable a person to be able to access, understand, appraise, and use information and services to participate in decisions related to their health. So in the US, uh, these differences in education um, languages spoken, health behaviors, health systems, characteristics, these all contribute to different, um, to different levels of health literacy across the US. And so here we have a diagram from a 2018 uh, CDC study that shows that in those regions of the country where the health literacy is highest, um, and those are marked yellow in the map, between 15 and 27% of the population is predicted to have low health literacy. So a little bit under a quarter of the prison, or excuse me, a little bit over a quarter of the population um, has lower health literacy. However, in the lowest health literacy level counties, those that are that can be seen in dark blue, uh, between 50, 36 and 59% of the population is predicted to have limited health literacy. So what does this mean? Uh, senior citizens and Medicare beneficiaries in those counties with the highest health literacy levels, so those that were marked yellow on the map, they experience better health outcomes. On average, those Medicare beneficiaries in, county, in those counties with the highest health literacy levels, they have, um, excuse me, with the highest health literacy levels have better outcomes as opposed to those with lower health literacy levels. And in those counties, the patients have four times higher healthcare costs, 6% more hospital visits, two day longer hospital stays, as well as more frequent hospital stays. Uh, they are less likely to follow recommended treatment plans leading to worse health outcomes. 
um, poor management of their chronic disease processes. They have less utilization of preventative health services, uh, more mental health distress, poorer quality of life. And for those who are interested in numbers, this leads to about a $236 billion annual cost for the healthcare system. And so here at UPMC, um, our own doctors Johnson and Nelson have conducted a study evaluating the health literacy of patients from the head and neck survivorship clinic that we just heard about. And in this study, 218 survivors were evaluated after adjusting for age, marital status, site, stage, treatment modality, and years since treatment completion, their social emotional quality of life scores for the survivors with adequate health literacy were about 11 points higher than those with inadequate health literacy. So what this means is that, you know, if we, if we say for every circumstance that we can predict in every circumstance, those with higher health literacy felt better. Um, and so the bottom line, what we saw is that inadequate health literacy is associated with a lower social quality of life in this population. So my research looks at the health literacy in the caregivers to these patients with head and neck cancer. This matters because in the United States, about 41 million people serve as caregivers for adult care recipients. Um, and, you know, in these informal caregiving roles, these people, whether they're spouses or children, maybe sometimes even neighbors, they perform medical, nursing, or other management tasks for adults with these complex chronic health needs. Um, of, the, of that 41 million, 66% report having decision-making power regarding the care recipient's condition. And 63% of those people um, have decision-making power in how the patient communicates with healthcare providers um, on their behalf, on behalf of the care recipient. And so for patients with really complex care needs, such as those with head and neck cancer, it's really important that their caregivers have the tools to interact with their providers alongside or on their behalf, um, as well as for providers to understand the significant contribution that these caretakers may have on our patient's health. Um, a way that I've really started thinking about it is that if you are in a pediatric population, if your patient is the kid, it is very important that the caretaker, the parent or guardian understands how to take care of them. And so we can think about it in a similar way. So we know that inadequate health literacy among patients has been associated with lower quality of life. That's from the study that I just mentioned, but we don't have very much information on how caregiver health literacy impacts the patient outcomes. To return to the analogy I used, of, or excuse me, the example I used of pediatric patients, most of the studies to date actually do focus on the health literacy of caregivers to children. However, there are very few um, studies looking at the health literacy of caregivers to adult cancer patients. And so this data is important because as we're seeking to improve outcomes constantly in our head and neck cancer survivors, we could also be working against a very large barrier to the overall improvement of these patients' quality of life. Um, and so, you know, it makes sense that for these patients who have caregivers that are shouldering, you know, a tremendous burden of managing their complex care needs, the caregiver's health literacy or lack thereof could have a similar impact on the outcomes. And so our study actually uses a validated tool for assessing health literacy, particularly in this population. So caregivers to cancer patients. And so um, what you see here is a diagram of the tool. And um, this is called the Health Literacy to Caregivers Scale Cancer. And so um, this is a validated tool that assesses 10 domains relevant to the health literacy of that particular population. And these domains are proactivity and determination to seek information, adequate information about cancer and cancer management, support by healthcare providers to understand information, social support, cancer-related communication with the care recipient, understanding the needs of the care recipients as well as their preferences, uh, self-care, so just the care of the caregivers for themselves, understanding of the healthcare system in general, 
their capacity to process health information and active engagement with providers. And so patient reported outcomes are the tools, uh, or excuse me, patient reported outcome measures are the tools and or instruments that have been developed to ensure that both a valid and reliable measurement of patient reported outcomes, such as quality of life matters. Um, so clinically, the inclusion of these patient reported outcomes through the use of these measures, um, it provides a more complete understanding of how a certain treatment or intervention or therapy impacts the patient. Um, and in research, these outcome measures really help us to make sure that the research is relevant to patients and their goals. Um, and that way, making sure that we have the appropriate kind of measures and criteria that we're selecting when we are evaluating something like quality of life. Uh, and so we use these to assess how certain factors such as health literacy impact aspects of the patient's life, such as uh, depression, anxiety, sleep quality, stress, and of course, quality of life, which are all patient reported outcomes that are used in my study. And so the, as Dr. Johnson mentioned, I just finished my research year and we were fortunate enough to get a tremendous amount of people um, and respondents. And so we used 102 responses from caregivers and patient groups um, and they completed this survey. The caregivers were mostly retired Caucasian women caring for a spouse or parent. Um, the mean health literacy of caregivers score for cancer was actually 82.23. So higher scores indicated a higher health literacy. And we saw a we saw a correlation between several of those domains and depression, anxiety, quality of life, and insomnia. So for domain two, which was adequate information about cancer and cancer management, domain five, cancer-related communication with the care recipient, domain six, understanding care recipient needs and preferences, and domain seven, which was self-care, we found that each of those domains corresponded to a shift in the quality of life um, for the caregivers, excuse me, as well as their anxiety, depression, and insomnia. And so using this tool, this has allowed us to see that our respondents had on average uh, more proactivity and determination to seek information. They were receiving pretty good information about cancer and management. They felt that they had good support from healthcare providers to understand their information as well as solid social support. They felt that they were able to communicate effectively with their care recipient. Um, they endorsed self-care, understood the healthcare system pretty well. Um, they had less difficulty processing health information and a lot more active engagement with healthcare providers. And so, as I mentioned, these are preliminary results. However, um, Dr. Nelson did speak on the, some of the differences that we might see in urban versus rural populations. And so preliminary results show that health literacy is not, um, it's, it's not too bad in this population. However, there may be room for us to use this tool to see how some of our groups of patients as well as their caregivers can be getting more support from the clinical team. And so um, in conclusion, we know that health literacy among patients is related to their quality of life. And so we wanna make sure that the caregivers who are indirectly, they're not our patients, but the caregivers are very much a part of the care team. We wanna make sure that they are also very well versed in the, in the management of these disease processes. So thank you so much. Great, so now Alexander Harris is gonna finish our, our talk. She has been working with us right now in research. It's been a great pleasure to have both her and Jamira with us and giving us uh, new ideas on what to pursue and what to ask and inquire of our patients and our caregivers. All right, so um, as introduced, my name is Alex and I'm here to talk to you about neck disability and swallowing dysfunction in head and neck cancer survivors. So. 
we talk a lot about um, We talk a lot about uh, who's affected by head and neck cancer. So every year, over 60,000 people in the US are affected, most of whom are diagnosed with advanced stage disease and require multimodal therapy. Survivors treated with these therapies often experience significant acute, late, and long-term toxicities, which result in the fibrosis and pain within structures that elicit swallowing and speech, resulting in difficulty with alimentation, communication, and musculoskeletal dysfunction. While it's been suggested that deintensification of treatment may help alleviate some of these issues, long-term follow-up and physical therapy have really been what's shown to improve the, the outcomes. As the uh, demographic shifts from those who have a history of tobacco use to those with HPV-related carcinoma, we're finding that there's a younger cohort uh, of patients with prolonged survivorship courses presenting a unique challenge to the multidisciplinary survivorship model where there's a need for significant long-term follow-up and therapy to mitigate the progression of these toxicities. So two of the common side effects are swallowing dysfunction, which affects up to three quarters of survivors and leads to complications such as weight loss, nutritional deficiency, and aspiration, which can contribute to pneumonia. And we also see neck dysfunction, which uh, affects up to two thirds of patients who, who experience weakness, atrophy, and shoulder and neck pain headaches, muscular contracture, and it can affect the survivor's ability to concentrate, work, sleep, and drive. So just going into dysphagia a little bit. So dysphagia and swallowing dysfunction themselves encompass a wide variety of oropharyngeal issues facing survivors. So normal swallowing involves three phases. The oral phase, which involves chewing and preparing food for swallowing. The pharyngeal phase, which provides the propulsion, or which involves the propulsion of food posteriorly eliciting reflexes, including the elevation of the soft palate to prevent food from entering the nasal cavity, uh, contraction of the pharyngeal constrictor muscles, closure of the vocal folds and epiglottis to prevent aspiration. And additionally, the esophageal phase, which propels food towards the stomach with peristaltic waves. And that timing takes about 20 seconds um, to reach for food to reach the stomach. So. For head and neck cancer survivors, disruption in any step of this process may lead to swallowing dysfunction. This includes xerostomia, trismus, vocal fold immobility, fibrosis of the constrictor muscles. They can all contribute to the swallowing dysfunction experienced by these survivors. So the current research focuses on prevention and early intervention for these survivors. We know that surgery and radiation can result in fibrosis in the structures which elicit the swallowing and speech and Result in part, the uh, resulting in part with the difficulty for alimentation and communication, and contributing additionally to the wasting that we see post treatment. Um, a study by Messing uh, and others showed that this uh, prophylactic pre treatment intervention can help to improve these outcomes in oral motor function, swallowing efficiency, trismus, and overall oral intake. This was additionally supported by research by Carnaby Mann and Carroll, who found that with early intervention after treatment, you can pr uh, preserve swallowing function and muscle mass, and sometimes even improve it. All of these studies together support the idea that the severity of dysphagia can be reduced by pretreatment prophylactic and early post-treatment therapy and rehab with the prognosis influenced by factors such as the adherence to the rehab disease recurrence, the individual's uh, own genetics, and comorbid conditions. They additionally highlight the importance of the inclusion of swallowing therapy and survivorship initiatives. So neck, neck disability is similarly complex. It's got a large variety of causes, including difficulty with range of motion, speed of motion, and neck pain, which can prevent participation in daily activities. So a growing body of research uh, indicates that the treatment with um, neck dissection or radiation therapy contributes to this chronic neck and shoulder dysfunction in a significant number of post-treatment survivors. These survivors or these therapies contribute to not uh, the development of muscular atrophy, weakness, and contracture as a result of treatment-induced fibrosis. And they can contribute both to the neck disability and dysphagia in the form of poor posture, shoulder, uh, the, the shoulder and uh, contracture, 
and misalignment, trismus and increased pain, limiting participation in social and daily activities. Now, a study at Vanderbilt found that up to 70% of the post-treatment survivors had neck disability in the form of decreased cervical range of motion, trismus, and postural deviation. But over 90% in their study also had shoulder misalignment and head tilt. A study performed here in Pittsburgh by Drs. Magania, uh, Dr. Nelson, and Dr. Johnson with the participation of the survivorship uh, at the UPMC survivorship clinics uh, showed that these survivors who had little to no reported neck disability had increased cervical range of motion and velocity compared to those with mild to moderate disability in all degrees of freedom. They also found that there was a relationship between the neck disability and the neck pain that survivors experienced. These survivors who reported higher neck disability scores are effective in their day-to-day -day lives in tasks that are dependent on things such as reaction time and range of motion, like driving and needing to turn your head while driving. Their objective measurement found that or supports the use of these patient reported outcomes to identify those survivors for whom access to therapy can provide an objective benefit. So we know that these two post-treatment toxicities are significantly associated with the decreased quality of life in survivors. We hear that directly from the survivors themselves in clinic, but that leaves us with the question of how do we help mitigate these problems and how are they related? So perceived dysphagia and neck pain and disability are closely linked to the severity of these treatment associated toxicities, but what about the relationship between neck disability and dysphagia? And can they together be mitigated by early therapeutic intervention? So thanks to the participation of survivors in the survivorship clinic, we've been able to look specifically at how these outcomes relate in post-treatment head and neck cancer survivors. Our approach was to examine the relationship between the two patient reported outcomes completed by survivors at their visit, the neck disability index and the eating assessment tool. The purpose of this work was to explore the prevalence of patient reported neck disability and symptoms of swallowing dysfunction and just understand the relationship between these two symptoms in the post-treatment survivors, potentially leading to identification of focused areas of intervention and potential therapeutic targets. Now, our results found that there was a significant relationship between these two outcomes and with the increases uh, in neck disability scores with, uh, associated with the increases in swallowing dysfunction scores, both indicating a higher symptom burden. Specifically, we found that the stage of diagnosis, the treatment modality, and the EAT-10 scores were significantly associated with the NDI scores. We also found that those who pre presented with more advanced carcinoma experienced more severe neck disability after treatment. We found a similar relationship with the swallowing dysfunction scores. Now, together, the, like this agrees with previous research, which found that individuals with head and neck cancer staged from T1 to T4 along with an unaffected control, with the, with the increase in stage, the amount of pharyngeal delay, oral transit time, and oral residue after swallowing increased. Now, we hypothesized some of the reasons for this include that the damage from the tumor itself to the nearby structures and the need for more aggressive treatment for these later stage carcinomas. The tumor-related uh, damage includes effects caused by increased inflammation, the presence of tumor-related macrophages, which have been found in oral, uh, oral squamous cell carcinoma, and that tumor size in other cancers has been correlated with increased vascular invasion in nearby tissue, um, possibly contributing in a similar way to the fibrotic changes seen in head and neck cancer as well. So as mentioned before, we found a significant relationship between the higher self-reported swallowing dysfunction and increasing levels of neck disability, even when controlling for age, time since treatment, treatment modality, and cancer stage. Additionally, we found that the um, improvements in uh, functional oral intake, such as maintenance of a normal diet compared with the need for tube feeds or limitations to food types able to be consumed was also associated with improved neck disability scores, supporting the findings of the patient reported swallowing measures. Um, understanding the pathology 
has been a little bit more challenging. So a review uh, by King attempted to classify the types of injury that we see in these post-treatment radiation patients. And they classified it into two categories, an early and delayed type, but found that with the research into the delayed type, it was a little bit lacking. Um, early damage they found was associated with damage to, specifically to superficial structures. So things such as like the dermal and muc mucosal layers, and they resolve shortly after treatment completion. Delayed damage was associated with a variety of factors, including you know, the treatment duration, the intensity of treatment, and pathologic changes included genetic damage, disruption to cells such as fibroblast endothelial cells and myocytes, which led to prolonged healing, disorganized collagen deposition, and vascular changes. This disruption in cellular processes may be responsible in part for the vascular changes in capillary endothelial cell damage, which leads to vascular constriction and ischemia of the uh, surrounding tissue and the muscles related to swallowing and neck movement. This damage may additionally contribute to the fibrosis seen in the post-treatment survivors and be responsible for the, neovascularization, the need for the neovascularization seen in the radiation treatment area. Additional analysis is really, uh, has revealed not only are these swallowing and neck disability scores correlated, we initially see an improvement in swallowing in the first five years, which then progresses in severity over time for survivors. We found that neck disability is associated with a similar trend, suggesting that there is some sort of underlying mechanism responsible for both outcomes. Research by Baudelaire also showed that there also found a nonlinear trends for both swallowing and disability, neck disability, with both neck disability and dys, uh, dysphagia progressing over five to 10 years post-treatment, supporting that these side effects of treatment are related to this delayed pathway of injury. With the therapy targeting neck disability and swallowing dysfunction individually having been shown to improve respective outcomes, a multidisciplinary treatment plan integrating both neck and swallowing rehab may improve overall patient outcomes. More research is, is definitely warranted to try to figure out what we can do to treat both of these symptoms and what we can do to influence the perceived symptoms of each deficit. Additional research within the survivorship team hopes to find objective causes, such as genetic find, and findings on imaging related to the severity of disability, which can help determine which survivors may have more complicated post-treatment courses. Um, so just kind of in summary, like neck, neck disability and swallowing dysfunction are both really common effects of treatment for swallowing or for uh, head and neck cancer survivors. The post-treatment head and neck cancer survivors who experience the neck, neck disability were significantly more likely to also experience swallowing dysfunction. Uh, the, these results that thanks to the survivorship clinic we're finding supports the need for the integration of care following not only the treatment, but even maybe before the treatment starts. And for facilitation of access to these early therapeutic interventions to mitigate the severity of the disability following treatment. Hopefully further studies uh, will be <laughs> performed. They're definitely warranted to investigate the relationship between neck disability and swallowing dysfunction. And uh, use, having rehab as a combined effort between the two. Um, and just wanted to say thanks to the Ioneer Foundation, uh, UPMC Survivorship Clinic, and everybody who works within the clinic, such as Dr. Nielsen and Dr. Johnson. Terrific. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, this has been a, a, a really interesting presentation. Um, we're open now for uh, questions and answers. I, I see that we already have um, a few questions for the panelists. Um, all you need to do is on your Zoom screen, go down to the bottom of the screen, it says Q&A. Click on Q&A and type your question there. We're ready to now go to the panelists with those questions. Um, and they're all here ready to, uh, to, to uh, respond and answer. So um, first, uh, the question on we have here is, um, well, one wants somebody would like to know if your slides will be available, and, and uh, we're actually going to have this program available for you recording it. We'll make it available online, and we'll inform everybody when that is done. 
Um, I'm sure we can also talk to you individually about slides and maybe I'll ask Dr. Uh, uh, Nielsen to help you with that. Um, but how are you describing the metro area as different from the urban area? I think that might be a question for Jamira. So we can both probably answer it. So that's um, Dr. Nosa Osasawa peters study. At least one way to do it is using RUCA codes. So rural urban community um, codes, which are based on census tract data or zip code data. Um, so that's the measure that they use. There's other kind of measures of, of looking at deprivation also by zip code. So the area of deprivation index is a way to define areas that tend to not have as many resources as um, others. So like South Hills and Mount Lebanon are going to have a higher um, or a lower deprivation score as opposed to maybe a more rural area. Well, yeah, I uh, um, thank you. And for those of you who aren't from Pittsburgh, I, you know, South Hills and, and Monroeville are in the suburbs of Pittsburgh <laughs> community. So, um, uh, so please go ahead uh, and type your questions in um, as we uh, are open for Q and A part of the of the session. Um, you know, obviously, the, you know, this is the first of these programs. I'll share with you now that uh, the next one coming up next Wednesday will be uh, put on by the folks from MD Anderson, University of Texas. And, uh, and, and that topic is going to be current standards and innovations for dysphagia management for head and neck cancer by Dr. Kate Hutchinson. So um, I'll look for any more questions and, uh, and, and you know, I, I'll, you know, uh, give you guys a few seconds, but I want to thank all the panelists again because, you know, this is certainly a program that um, we're very proud of here at the University of Pittsburgh. We at the INEAR Foundation are incredibly proud to support this program, and we have been supporting it for a number of years as uh, Dr. Nielsen and Dr. Johnson both, um, you know, got together and, and started to look at the, the, um, the relationship of, of, um, of, uh, uh, of outcomes related to, you know, uh, head and neck cancer treatment and, and how that affects patients and their survivorship. And you can see by what was presented today that, it, you know, that there's so much to learn and there's so much to, that we can um, then change in terms of our practices and procedures from what we learn. So we're very proud to support this. We're also very proud to see that the results that we saw today in terms of discovery and, um, and this is how we make, you know, we, we, we find ways to improve care. So um, I think they did such a great job of presenting that our, uh, that our attendees did not have too many questions. So, um, you know, but welcome. We had a very large audience and appreciated the chance to introduce this to you today and present this to you today. And uh, um, if there aren't any more questions, then I guess we will say adieu and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Um, anything, Dr. Johnson or Dr. Nielsen, that you'd like to say to end the program? Oh, no? I'd like okay. to just thank everyone who attended for coming in and listening. We welcome you to uh, these next three programs uh, on each Wednesday this month. So have a good day. Okay, folks. Enjoy the rest of your day and uh, we're having a nice day here in Pittsburgh. I hope it is where, where you are as well. You take care. Sunny here. <laughs> Thanks everybody.